we'll go ahead and get started. And uh, thank you all for coming today. My name is Denise Bernard. I'm a volunteer with the UC Master Gardeners of Monterey and Santa Cruz counties. And I'd like to welcome you to today's program, program Fall in the Garden, which is something you don't want to do, but it's something you want to learn about. We're ready to go. Before we get really started here, uh, we want to get all those little housekeeping things out of the way. Uh, we ask you to keep your microphone muted. There are quite a few of us in here and it could get pretty distracting if we do have everybody chattering. Um, also, if you can keep your video off, uh, it helps the program run more smoothly and is also less distracting. So we really appreciate if you can go ahead and do that. We recommend using speaker view. That way you'll get the, the biggest uh, space to see all the information that you're going to be looking at today. We'll answer any questions that you have um, at the end of the program. Just go ahead and put them in the chat anytime during uh, the program. You can go ahead and put those in and we'll just keep track of them and answer everything at the end. If you have any technical questions, go ahead and uh, just message me, Denise Pennard, and I will uh, see if I can't get you working and get things on track for you. We did, um, set up the live transcript. Uh, the button is down at the bottom. It's more or less like closed captions. You can go ahead and add that if you'd like to see uh, everything along with hearing it. Um, let's see, I think that is about all that we've got for today on this part. And I'll just let you know a little bit about who we are uh, for anyone who might not be familiar with the Master Gardener program. We've been around for over 40 years now. We're all volunteers. We work in partnership with the Agriculture and Natural Resources Division of the University of California. We all receive comprehensive training and our job is to provide outreach and research-based education on horticulture, pest management, sustainable practices for home gardeners in our local uh -huh. uh, communities. <laughs> I don't all know right. what happened there. All right. Let's Somebody see. just took over the Zoom controls. <laughs> Somebody right. who has friends in a pool. <laughs> it's a great Watch picture. See if I can stop that person from screen sharing. <laughs> I don't want to do This is very interesting. Whoever is sharing, could you stop sharing? There we go. Okay. All right. Yes, there I you want go, to Talisa. stop that other person. And I want to share. And here we have it again. All Great. right. We're back on track. Here we go. I am just about ready to turn it over to our speakers for today, uh, Denise and Bridget. There you go. Okay, Denise, you're in charge of muting. <laughs> the I, I'm working on Santa that. Cruz, uh, garden guides for the fall. And it's like, oh my God. <laughs> Okay. I'm gonna wait till everybody is muted to get started here. We're almost finished up here. Could everybody mute themselves? And I think we've had it. Great. Gosh, thank you all for coming. So many people in this class. It's very exciting. I'm Delise Ware, and this is my partner in crime, Bridget Matz. We've been master gardeners forever since 2014 anyway. Um, I personally love growing food flowers and I'm getting into herbs big time. I've worked for Renee's Garden, a seed company and uh, Renee Shepherd, Shepherd Seeds back in the day. I went to school at UCSC as an environmental studies major, major and I love to teach. Bridget? You with us, Bridget? Bridget, oh. you're muted. I'll ask and, you to unmute. I'm so sorry. I don't know why mine's going back and forth between being muted and unmuted without me touching it. Um, okay. Anyway, um, hello, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening to learn a little bit about fall gardening. Um, I have a lot of experience growing a variety of vegetables, flowers, and culinary herbs. I'm also a master composter in Santa Clara County. I'm a former UCSC farm and garden apprentice. So it was also a second year um, working for Orrin Martin in the Up Garden. And I also love to teach and I'm very much looking forward to our evening together tonight. 
Okay. So today we're going to go over ways that fall gardening is different than spring gardening. It's really kind of a class for beginners or for people who have gardened mostly in the spring and summer and they want to know how it's different in the fall and, and want to keep going. Our format tonight is a little bit different than our usual. We tend to do a deep dive with lots of detail in a, in a single topic. Today we are going to go over high level information on many, many different topics. We're going to provide you with a bunch of resources. They're in the presentation, um, lots of links. You should have the presentation in your email if you signed up for this class. And if you don't, we're going to send it afterwards with all the speaker notes in it. So you should have all the information you need to teach yourself many things. And we'll point to you to classes that are happening soon that you can take advantage of and get more detail. We'll leave plenty of time for QA at the end. And um, I believe there's a number of master gardeners on this call. So if you have any questions, um, feel free throughout the presentation to put them in the chat. Denise is going to keep track of the questions and she's going to feed them back to us at the end. Um, so we're just going to go blah, blah, blah in a kind of a one way communication, not optimal, but with so many people and so many topics and so little time. That's what we've got to do. Next. So what you will come away with is um, you will you will leave this class with the options to progress, improve, and prepare your garden for the fall, winter, and spring. Um, you'll know what you can do and grow this time of year. You'll get the timing right. Now, the timing is critically important because in fall, it's so much less forgiving than the spring. In spring, you can put something in the ground. It might be too early. It'll probably limp along, and then it'll get warm, and bam, it'll be successful. And with fall gardening, it's the exact opposite. So we'll um, we'll take it from there. All right, we are planting with the seasons. Some of this will be very basic for some of you and um, and maybe not for all of you. So what happens in the fall, and everybody knows this intuitively, but it's it's good to really watch it and and make note of the angles of the sun. So the sun obviously uh, goes into its winter orientation. It's uh, coming in through more layers of atmosphere. So it's, it's weaker sun. Uh, it's casting longer shadows. It's maybe not shining on the same garden beds or places that it did in the summer. So you can have a completely different garden situation in the summer as you do in the winter. So what I like to do is go out in the, um, during the solstice and the equinoxes. And um, I do a little map and I kind of track full sun, partial sun, partial shade, full shade. And I just do a little indicator at each time of year what is going on in my garden and where it's happening. That is a good thing to do and I recommend it. And of course, the other thing that happens is it gets colder and in a perfect world, it gets a little wetter, it gets windier. And what's happening is all the plants are mo moving towards a dormant phase. So they're kind of going to sleep. And we're going to take advantage of that in some of the activities that we are talking about today. A friend of mine once said, soil grows in the winter, plants grow in the summer. The soil does a lot of work renewing itself during the cold winter months. And we can take advantage of that. Let's talk about how. All right, we talked about the things we can't do in the fall. What can we do? Well, the basis of all gardening is your soil. And uh, there, there's an entire class about this. There's a number of classes. Um, we are going to link to one of those presentations um, in, the, in the references here. But you just need to know, if you don't, soil is made out of rock. It's almost, four, it's 45% rock broken into tiny little particles, the mineral part, and then half of it is air and water, and you would never know that. But the thing that really, really, really makes it good soil is this little 5% piece of the pie, this delicious little piece of human humus, organic matter, and um, other organic uh, live things like roots and organisms and little microbes and biomes. Um, and this is critically important to the health of your soil, which means it's critically important to the soil of your plants. 
So if you don't do anything else this fall, add organic matter. And we're going to talk about different ways you can do that, easy ways and hard ways. But basically, organic matter does so many things for your soil. It's, it's like the fix-all for any problem. It makes it chunky and delicious, sticky and nutritious, like a breakfast cereal. It makes space for the air and water so you get good percolation through the soil. It, it provides food for all the minuscule little decomposers. Uh, it produces compounds that aggregate the tiny particles and minerals and different things, which uh, actually improves the soil structure and gives you more nooks and crannies for that water and air to move around in. Um, it makes the nutrients through some chemical magic available to the plants in the soil. And um, likewise, it corrects the pH. So again, those nutrients are more available to the plants. Um, lots of wonderful things. So if you have sandy soil, add compost. If you have clay soil, add compost. Just do that, add compost. And it doesn't have to be compost. It can be other forms of organic material. We'll talk about that in a second. So here's a great class on soils that you can look at the presentation for. And here's an overview on soil improvement. And this is an article. And we leave it to you to look at those things. Jet, uh, the master composter, is going to talk to us about this. All right. Hello again, everybody. So one great project that you can do in the fall is start or renew a compost pile and or a worm bin. Before I talk about though that though, I'd like to point out that we've got a small black flag in the upper right hand corner of this slide. And those have dates on it for, that will help you decide what um, is a good time to do some of the things we're talking about, whether they be projects, starting seeds or planting plants in the soil. Uh, composting is a natural process where a pile of yard waste, uh, spent plants, kitchen waste, other plant materials is broken down into a beautiful, beautiful organic matter that we call compost. It's also a wonderful way to recycle. Uh, compost is a fabulous soil amendment that once added to the soil helps to improve soil structure, fertility, and increase water holding capacity. The goal is to always be mindful that we are soil farmers first and foremost, because if we grow healthy soil, then the soil will grow healthy plants and basically take care of themselves. Okay almost, but it does a lot of work for you. <laughs> um, when we're talking about layering a compost pile, um, things that we want to keep in mind is that compost is made up of things that we call browns and greens. Browns are carbon rich materials and you want to keep in your mind um, things that are woody and examples of that would be dry leaves, branches, sawdust, straw, wood chips. Uh, greens are nitrogen rich, and you wanna keep in your mind things that might be lush. For example, food scraps, uh, green plant material, fresh grass clippings, manures. A basic compost pile construction um, is very simple. And it's a good rule of thumb to layer your materials in a two thirds brown to one thirds green ratio. You simply claim a spot um, in your garden, start with a base layer of straw or twigs, and then you start alternating between browns and greens at the two thirds to one third ratio. And after a few months, you'll have a nice compost to add to your soil before your spring plant planting. It's important not to overthink this or get too stressed out because as my former boss used to say, compost happens. Worm bins are a great alternative for people that might not have space to do a compost pile. And if you're like me, um, you might just prefer it regardless. It also is a very simple setup. It just requires you picking up a bin or um, making your own bin, maybe out of something you have laying around in the shed or the garage. Um, that you can drill your own air holes into. Add some damp shredded newspaper 
and add some worms. And after a few weeks, you can um, start adding your kitchen scraps and you will be off and running composting. Um, these are some compost resources that we have for you that dive deeper into the things that I was just glossing over for you. And I can I point out that in Santa Cruz, they have these free compost uh, classes done by the, the recycling folks. Um, they will give you a free worm bin and, and or a free uh, compost bin if you take those classes. It's pretty fun. I did that. All right, we're gonna move into some low effort um, soil building. A couple examples of that is straw bale gardening and or lasagna garden. Sheet mulching, um, some people refer to it as um, lasagna, making lasagna out of your garden beds. Um, sheet mulching is a great way to re-mediate um, your soil, suppress weeds, and hopefully if you haven't already, start getting rid of your lawns. Um, you can work around your existing plants and trees, and also um, you can punch through your sheet mulch and plant directly into it. There are many, many, many different ways to sheet mulch and many different recipes to choose from. The most important ingredient is to choose things that you have on hand and or are fairly easy for you to collect. Before you begin, you'll need an ample amount of what you'll be working with stockpiled because you'll need a lot of material. One great example of a good sheet mulching recipe, I think, is um, to start off with a very thick layer of cardboard. I picked mine up from the plethora of bike shops that we have in Santa Cruz. They are happy to load your car with it and have you drive off away with their recycling. Um, one special note is when you do layer your cardboard is you wanna make sure that you're layering it by a good eight to 12 inches. If you leave any cracks, then that's a avenue for your weeds to come right back up or your, your lawn to get a, a shot at starting again. Um, if you're working on a hillside, a good little tip is to use some landscape staples so you're not sliding around on the hill while you're trying to do your project. Um, after you've got a really good layer of cardboard down, um, you will um, layer it with whatever you choose. Uh, I have access to horse manure, so I go with horse manure and or spent co compost. Then um, I'll top that with a hefty layer of straw, and then I like to layer some wood chips on top of that. And once again, that's just a recipe that I prefer, cardboard, manure, straw, wood chips. But like I said, there's many ways to do it. And there's a lot of folks that just do a layer of cardboard and top it with several inches of mulch. I, I wanted to point out that we're gonna be having a class in November. It's gonna be a wildflower garden planting and, and uh, seed sowing class. And we're gonna demonstrate a lasagna garden. So look for that. That'll be fun. Okay. Here are your resources, just so you know. And I'm going the wrong direction. That's what's happening. Nope, nope we're not going the wrong direction. This is me, I'm talking about this. Okay, <laughs> all right. Some of us are lazy. I happen to be a very lazy gardener. And the easiest way for me to improve soil is slowly over time. Um, and I've been known to do this with straw bales. No. If you haven't heard of straw bale gardening, which most people have, in a nutshell, you haul one or more straw bales into a sunny spot in a yard. You want to put it on soil, don't put it on the driveway, um, unless you don't have any other sun, sunny spot. But for me, half the battle is it helps improve the soil underneath the bale over the years that it's decomposing. So uh, you water it for a couple of weeks, it gets kind of a little softer, it starts to heat up and decompose inside. You add some fertilizer, I use blood meal to start the bale really decomposing. And then it gets soft enough that you can dig a hole, put a little potting soil in there and plant directly into the bale. So basically within six or eight weeks, you have a place that you can plant plants. They grow like crazy, you have to keep them fertilized. And then after a year and a half, 
this whole straw bale just kind of decomposes into a into a pile of mush that turns into beautiful organic matter that can be dug into the soil that's already full of worms and biotic life and you get a fertile rich garden bed and i've been known to just put some rocks around it and call it a raised bed november using this senescence or you know a sleepy time in the garden November is the best time to do this because it's going to be raining and it's going to start that decomposition process up front um, without wasting any water and you don't have to condition the bales quite as much. You can technically start them any time of year, but for water saving, November is a good time to start them. And as you can see on the left here, you can also square them up like little Legos and make raised bed borders out of the bales. Um, that works really well. And um, Bridget came to my house this afternoon and uh, pointed out that I have some really ugly decomposing straw bales in my front yard. We're getting ready to do a, a revamp of those beds, but uh, they are not for everyone and you may not want them in your front yard because they do get hideously ugly. Here's the preferred resource on that. I think it's a video. Um, no, here's the video and this is the handout. So that's really going to tell you everything you know. And there's many more resources online for straw bale gardening. However, the very best thing you can do for your soil is to plant a winter cover crop. And I usually do that around Thanksgiving. This is a crop that is not something you necessarily eat. It is something that you just grow to cover the soil, enrich the soil, make the little biotic life in the soil happy, and um, it adds organic matter if you turn it into the soil in the spring. So if you plant the right beans or peas, they will create nitrogen nodules on the roots, making the soil more fertile in the spring. And the green part on top protects the surface from compaction when it rains really hard or from erosion. Cover crops make sense in a bed that doesn't have any other annuals growing it or any perennials, or you can plant them around perennials, but it kind of needs to be disturbed and, and dug up um, later. So um, don't want to disturb anything, but it's also a, gr a great way to get a brand new bed started. And I actually want to open one of these links. So here's um, some information on choosing the right cover crop for you. Um, but I'm going to open this guy, and this is a cover crop solutions chart. <clears throat> it's from a retailer. We don't talk about retailers here at the Master Garden Program, but this is one that sells these, these seeds. And you can see this list goes on and on and on, and at the line, you are, you're at the end of the, the cool season crops. So everything Above that line, you can see on the right-hand side is cool season cover crops. And so you can see you have lots of kind of plants to pick to choose from. And then the little dots will tell you from the columns, what is it gonna do for you? Is it gonna create nitrogen? Is it gonna be forage for your pet goat? Is it gonna uh, compete? Is it gonna compete with the weeds and keep the weeds from getting out of hand? Is it gonna help with erosion? Is it gonna give you uh, beneficial insects, a place to live? Is it native? So many things that these do for us. Love those plants. Okay. Another thing that people do in the fall, and this happens different times of year, is, is saving seeds. So these are plants that over, over summers, and now it's fall and they're getting all kind of dry and you haven't yanked them out yet. If you have never done this before, it's it's a fun thing to do. It's an empowering thing to do. So um, it's also a complete class and very complicated topic on its own. You can't do it with just about anything. You have to be cognizant that it is not a hybrid. I, a hybrid is a combination of two different parent plants that combine to make a hybrid that is a combination of two sets of, um, of uh, genes that result in something we like. So when you save seed from a hybrid, it's gonna to revert to one or the other of the parents. 
and you're not going to get the same plant over again. Um, ideally, you don't want biennial. That gets complicated. That's a plant that uh, flowers after two years. Carrots, an example of a biennial. And there's something about being at our latitude that doesn't make biennial seed saving. It doesn't save a very vigorous plant. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And ideally, uh, it's self-pollinated. <clears throat> you want it self-pollinated so that um, you don't have a situation where plants that cross, for example, cucurbits or plants in the squash family, you can have a zucchini over here and a pumpkin over there, and a bee can make the journey and pollinate one with the other. And if you save seed from either the zucchini or the pumpkin, you may get a situation where if you plant that seed and try and grow it out, you get a really weird zoo pumpkin that isn't good for very much. So you wanna avoid that. You have to know how it's pollinated, you have to know if it's a hybrid or not. Um, and so that's complicated. But for um, those of us who want the easy way, peas and beans are always a good place to start. They're self-pollinated, and who doesn't have some beans that they didn't pick and they're kind of drying on the vine? Lettuce goes to flower. It's a, that's another good one that you can um, you can definitely save those if they're not hybrid. And annual flowers is probably the easiest one because you don't have any risk. You're not eating the flowers usually, um, but that can uh, you can save flowers easily. Um, the seeds are obvious, usually. Uh, you just shake them off and dry them. And then tomatoes and peppers are a little more advanced because they have a wet fruit that you have to extract the seeds from, and that's a, that's a whole process. But if you want to learn more about that, you go to one of these uh, resources. And the heart is next to the seedsavers.org website. And they have great information, and they also have great uh, non-hybrid seeds to choose from. So there's where you learn more. Bridget is going to talk flowers. All right. So we are going to talk about some flowers that you could, and bulbs that you could consider planting in the fall season. Um, some examples of things that you can plant this time of year in a few categories from easy to grow to slightly more challenging are cool season flowers, wildflowers and poppies, native meadow flowers, and fall planted bulbs. This slide um, is depicting some bulbs and corms that you could choose to plant in the fall. And there's some nice examples in that list for you. Bulbs are showy and easy to grow. It's nice to look for South African bulbs such as Crocosmia, Ixia, Spark... Spiraxis. Thank you, Delise. And Watsonia <laughs> for drought resistant bulbs that come back year after year. Everyone's European favorite, of course, are tulips, but they're a bit more fussy. Uh, they need to be pre-chilled for at least four to six weeks before planting, and they seldom come back the following year unless they are lifted out of the soil and chilled again. They're also a bit spendy on the budget. Daffodils are bulletproof and gopher resistant and a good choice for beginners. And this slide is our fall planted bulb resources. And that, once again, you can go through after the presentation and take a deeper dive and find out some more detailed information. And in this slide, um, we've got some ideas for you of cool season annual flowers to transplant. These are plants um, that are a bit too late to start from seed, but you're typically going to find them in garden centers as seedlings. And they are an easy way to add instant fall color to your yard. And we'll list some of the Santa Cruz and Monterey garden centers later in the presentation, as well as a slideshow on how to choose seedlings wisely. And in this slide, um, we've got some ideas for you on cool season annual flowers to direct sow. 
these flowers are sown from seed in the fall for flowering in early spring. Many people see poppies or sweet peas blooming in March and April and then try to plant them. If these plants are already blooming, it's good to know that it's probably too late to start them from seed. Uh, note, flower seed is often very, very tiny and plants are slow to germinate and vulnerable during their emergence phase. For best success with tiny seed, make sure you've cleared the weeds and prepared the soil very well. It's a nice idea to mix the seeds with some dry, clean sand to sow them and keep them evenly moist for the first three to four weeks and try to protect them as best you can from slugs, snails, and if we get it, hopefully we do, pounding rain. Um, it helps to hold some seed back just in case you might need to reseed in January or February after seeds emerge um, and you see what is coming up for you, then you might need to also do some thinning to prevent overcrowding. In this slide, we're going to give a shout out to some native annuals and wildflowers that you might consider planting. Uh, this is another category of seed sown flowers that you can plant now for spring and summer bloom. Native wildflowers attract and support native insects and pollinators. They are adapted to our California climate, soils, and once they're started, they're easy to grow and maintain. Often they will reseed once established and come back year after year on their own. And lucky for us, we have a fabulous class coming up in November given by a wonderful master gardener, Janice Cooch, and she's going to be talking about um, wildflowers, not weeds, and how to get your wildflowers going. Yeah, and that's up on our website, uh, mbmg.org now, and you guys can sign up for it soon. And once again, this is a, a slide just showing it, you some different links that you can do a, a further deep dive into more information on. And when we have a heart by something, um, we're just highlighting that we think that's an especially good resource on our slides. And Bridget, do you mind if I take us to a couple of those hearts? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, let's go to Calscape. This is your everything you ever wanted to know about native plants. So um, you can actually put in your home address and see what plants work really well in your backyard. It will give you a list. I'm not gonna do that right now. I'm gonna click on annuals here. And I'm gonna see a giant list of beautiful pictures. I'm gonna open one, California poppy, why not? I'm gonna get more images. How nice is that? I'm going to see where I can go to actually watch them growing in the wild. I'm going to get um, the size of the plant for my planning purposes, when or if it's dormant, how fast or slow it grows, things like that. Here is a little information on wildlife it supports. That's one of the most important things about natives is uh, the native pollinators and wildlife are are adapted to find those plants and they are in short supply these days due to habitat restrictions. So um, that's really fun. And then it will tell you what kind of conditions it needs. Does it need full sun, moisture, irrigation needs? It even gives you some nurseries that carry the, the plant, um, type of soils it prefers, everything you could possibly wanna know. It's a great website. And similarly, we're going to remember that uh, Calscape website when we go to the um, perennial section. Water wise gardening. Um, all of us are fighting a drought, or all of us are having trouble gardening in a drought. So there's this wonderful website. It's all about Santa Cruz plants. And if you see the very tiny, light colored navigation at the top, I'm just going to go to helpful plant lists. It has, um, it has uh, categories, lawn substitutes, native plants. So this has native and non-native. I'm gonna go to low water perennials. Again, I get lovely pictures. 
and I'm going to look at a penstemon. And here again, it tells me everything I need to know about what the plant looks like. It describes the plant, information on culture, soil water growth rate, and some design features. Is it an accent flower? Pretty fancy. I think this is a great site too. I go, I use these two all the time. So I'm done blabbing. Your turn. I know it's still my turn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're keeping track of these little black flags that tell you the date range that you can do this sort of thing. Um, in September through November, maybe even into December. Again, everything's going to sleep. Nothing's going to, uh, you know, is going to pop up with a bright flower at this point. Um, but it is such an important time to plant perennials. So if you're going to redo your lawn, if you're going to um, get rid of your lawn, um, drought tolerant or drought resistant perennials are a great selection. And you can do a combination of that sheet mulching and then these perennials and really get started and kill that lawn dead. And then you have such a um, absolutely easy to maintain, beautiful looking garden. Um, it's, it's, it's just a game changer for those of us who have ever maintained a lawn. So over the fall is the best time to plant them. They come in little six inch or one gallon pots. Plants have all winter to establish strong, long root systems, and then they blast off in the spring and summer. And there are zillions of perennials to choose from. We can't give you a list, but consider details about um, what kind of conditions you have. What kind of solar exposure do you have? Are you looking for something that's part shade? Are you looking for bright sun? Um, how's your drainage? How's your, what's your soil type like? And that should factor into the plant selection. And here are a couple of more um, links. And the two that I just showed you would also pertain to selecting perennials. And if you do your homework by October 15th, you can go shopping at the Master Gardener plant sale. And these are all pretty much water, water wise perennials, <clears throat> some annuals, California natives, a bunch of succulents, Succulents didn't show up in this presentation, but um, they can be planted this time of year as well. Pollinators, pollinator plants, plants that are good for pollinators. They'll have some vegetables and some herbs. And these plants are lovingly, tenderly propagated and grown by master gardeners who are all volunteers. So you can support us and support your garden and support nature by coming and going shopping. It's going to be an online sale, and you can pick up your plants either in Salinas or we're going to have a Santa Cruz pickup area as well this year. So expanding our, our salvias and succulent and native bulb options, um, this is a good option for you guys. More homework. Now, this is um, these are plants you would plant in January. This is not fall gardening. But I just have to say that in these days, people want to grow their own food. And so we're finding that a lot of the food crops that are in uh, nurseries go like hotcakes. If you tried to buy seeds two years ago and couldn't find any on the shelf, if you tried to buy uh, bare root strawberries, anything like that, they were gone so quick. So I recommend that you figure out what you want to grow in your space. Uh, whether it be fruit trees, roses, asparagus, strawberries. These are all sold when they're dormant and um, they're pulled out of the ground, roots are hosed off, and then they're, they're just sort of stuck in these little tubs of sand or, or uh, damp uh, sawdust. And um, you can go to the garden centers, lift them up, see how involved the root system is. You want a, a nice vigorous root system. Look at the branching on the top level Look at the girth of the diameter of the, of the trunk, if it's a tree, and, um, and get the best specimen you possibly can. And they go quickly. You want to want to keep track of when they're, you know, coming in and then uh, grab the one you want. And so I feel like you can't do that soon enough. Ideally, you do that in person at garden centers. So we've listed some garden centers that, that carry these bare root plants in both Santa Cruz and Monterey. 
And if all else fails, you want some really weird plant that isn't showing up, you can do mail order. Now, Peaceful Valley here is a, um, is a retail outlet. There are probably lots of other mail order options, but these are just a few that popped up for us. So um, Peaceful Valley's good, they're retail. You can buy one tree. And Dave Wilson is um, requires that you buy in bulk. So that would be a neighborhood <laughs> collective order. Uh, and most of the trees you find in these nurseries are coming from Dave Wilson. They have very high quality plants. Um, that's what I know about that. And ideally, I would not do mail order just because you can't see the trees. Another nice resource is, is getting started with fruit tree videos done by uh, Oren Martin. He used to do that at San Lorenzo and the Garden Company before the <clears throat> pandemic. So Bridget's going to talk to us. We do a little bit deeper dive on vegetables because we are we are so interested in helping people produce food at home. Yes. Bridget? Home food production is a big focus for the UCMC, um, sorry, UCMG uh, program. So uh, we are going to talk a little bit about what uh, to plant when and how to plant it and whether we want it in flats or directly sown in the ground. And in this slide, we're going to also talk a little bit about cold hardy crops and um, semi hardy crops and whether or not they too want to be sown in a flat or directly into the ground. Um, hardiness is in the definition of the word. Cold hardiness is the ability for plants to resist injury during exposure to low temps and they can survive a freeze, a frost, or a cold snap. Semi-hardness, semi-hardness, excuse me, are plants that can survive a very light frost for a short period of time, but will need to be protected from anything more than a touch of frost and um, won't be able to survive a, a, a serious frost. In the slide, we have some examples of some crops that enjoy being sown in flats. Um, under cold hardy, there's some examples like broccoli, collards, kohlrabi. Under semi hardy, we've got some other examples of, let's pick a few, artichoke, cauliflower, some of the choys. Um, one little note about sowing uh, seeds for some of these crops like broccoli, it's a little bit too late to get um, seeds started. Um, if you want to get them planted in time, which for us in our area is about October 15th, really the beginning of the September is a better time to get those seeds started. So we just want to point that out. And I'm sorry, if we can go back to that other slide, Delise. Sorry. And then we also have a category of um, something that can be either sown in a flat or direct seeded. And just to pick out a few, we've got kale, you know, onions and leeks under cold hardy and in semi hardy, we've got lettuce and chard. And then we've got some crops that definitely uh, need to be direct seeded. And some examples of those things are peas and turnips, rutabagas in the cold hardy crops and in semi hardy crops, um, some examples are beets, carrots, Swiss chard. All right, what to plant when? Um, one of the biggest considerations that we need to keep in mind is what plants can be transplanted, direct seeded, and then thinned. Delise created this gorgeous and informative planting reference guide for us, and it'll be a wonderful resource for you and your garden planning. I use it all the time, I love it. And she's gonna take a few minutes and, and walk us through it. If it loads. All right, here we have it looking tiny. Let me see if I can make it bigger. Sorry guys, I'm just trying to bump up the font here. Okay. Is this better guys? Yes. 
All right, there's a lot of these around. This is a little more complicated one that I put together based on my research. And it has vegetable, vegetables, flowers, and herbs. It tells you whether, whether to sow it in the ground or indoors. It tells you how long to expect uh, to take for germination to happen. Now, it's really important to know that because when you sow seeds, sometimes you just give up the ghost way too early. It takes 20 days to get carrots up. And who's so many times I thought they weren't done. <clears throat> they weren't there, they didn't germ. And then they come up. Approximate days to harvest or maturity. This is always approximate. It's never correct. And then here are the date ranges when it's good to plant those seeds for the fall time frame. So we've got um that we have a little bit on where to get seeds. We have a the cool season crop grid you just saw, and that's it. Um, I use this often, and I offer it to you. It's a wonderful resource. Um, it's a great gift, so I I recommend that you take advantage of it. Um, in this slide, we're going to talk a little bit about planting and purchasing trip tips. Um, this is a good thing to keep in the back of your mind that you might want to get most of your veggies in the ground by October 15th. Of course, um, garden rules are made to be broken and it's going to vary from year to year according to what type of, you know, fall, beginning winter we're having, how much rain we've had. Um, all types of variables go into when you decide that you're going to get your plants in the ground. But October 15th is a really good thing to keep in your mind and a good thing to work around. And at the most, you'd probably be doing it a week before October 15th or a week after. One good thing that we like to point out is we highly recommend that you do not buy root crops um, with a taproot, something like a carrot or a beet in a six pack. And um, that is because root crops don't really do well as transplants. And if you're a novice gardener and you find yourself in a nursery that is selling root crops in a six pack, you might purchase them and put them in the ground and they will most likely fail for you. And you will think that maybe you're not a good gardener when actually the nursery kind of set you up to fail a little bit in that way. Um, I'm sorry, I have a fly that has joined the presentation trying to get into that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so one exception is onions, those things you will buy in sets. Um, in our area, um, we also need to be mindful that we will sometimes still get heat waves even after the starts of our rains have come. And um, we try to best prepare for those by making sure that our starts have plenty of water and if need be some shade. All right, we're gonna go over a few crops um, and we're gonna start off with brassicas, which I think, um, uh, pass slide please, Delise. Sorry, That's okay. it, it got away. Um, which I think is when we think of fall crops, it is probably um, brassicas, the cabbage family are probably at the top of everyone's list. Um, a thing to think about with brassicas, as we were just men mentioning, if you want to start them from seed, you really need to get them started by the first week of September. Um, if you've missed that date, then it's time to switch to buying seedlings from one of our wonderful nurseries. Um, Brassicas are the divas of the fall winter garden, just like tomatoes are the divas of the summer garden. Brassicas are plants um, in the cabbage family. And one fun fact that um, I like to point out but not everybody knows is that kale is a brassica and a member of the cabbage family. Brassicas will require most of your time in the fall jardin, just like tomatoes require most of your time in summer. 
Um, we've got um, a few little notes on each plant. On some broccoli plants, they will develop side shoots that you can harvest after the main head has harvest and continue to add them to your salads or roast them, whatever you enjoy doing with broccoli. Cauliflower is one head per plant. So once you harvest the head from that plant, that cauliflower is spent and you can save those big, huge leaves um, that surrounded that cauliflower for your compost piles. Um, Brussels sprouts are the longest um, in the ground. And uh, just a special note, especially for people that might not have grown them yet, is aphids love them. And um, by planting them, you will be inviting them into your garden. And um, you just kind of want to weigh out how much you want to battle aphids, um, or would you rather buy them from one of our lovely organic farmers markets in Santa Cruz? <laughs> Which is what I do. All right. Um, alliums in um, the allium family, we have onions and garlics. And Onions, leeks, and shallots are best grown from sets. And the most important thing that you need to remember is to choose short day varieties because that is the amount of sun that you're going to have during the fall and winter. And they need to be um, short day varieties. Other varieties won't work for you because you won't have enough sun um, for them to grow um, properly. They are heavy nitrogen feeders. And um, a, a special note on garlic is that garlic is like growing a baby. Garlic takes nine months before it is ready to be harvested. And if you are someone that might have a smaller garden space, you might want to weigh out if you really want to give up enough space um, to garlic for, you know, three months under a year. Um, some people do, they love garlic. I know some people that that's all they grow in the fall. They love it so much and um, harvest it. And uh, my friend is still trying to get into my eyes. Um, and, um, you know, use it to cook throughout the year. Or if you're lucky like me, they, they give it away for Thanksgiving and Christmas presents. That's just, you know, one good thing to keep in mind that it is a long-term crop. And a fun fact about onions is that whatever the flower color of um, your plant is will also be the bulb color. So that's a fun little, fun little fun fact. Hey, can I mention that we are going to be teaching a garlic class? Oh, good. Everything you ever wanted to know about garlic, and that's coming up in October. Um, and I'm one of those people that really has to plant garlic every year because there's some weird varieties and they taste really good. All right, um, leafy greens are things like lettuce, spinach, arugula, um, and other various greens. And we've just highlighted some things that we want you to keep in mind. Um, they're very frost sensitive. They're fast and easy to grow from seed. Um, one tip is that lettuce seed um, goes dormant above 75 degrees. So um, you need to plant indoors if for some reason you are doing seeding and during hot temperatures. They're very vulnerable to slugs, snails, and birds. So you wanna know um, what your protection plan is gonna be ahead of time. And Delise will be talking to us about good strategies for that later on in this presentation. Um, Radicchio loves the cooler weather, so it tastes better. Um, and all leafy greens are uh, nitrogen lovers. And um, a good trick for spinach seed, which some people have trouble getting started, um, is that they germinate very quickly after three days in the fridge on a damp paper towel. You outwit them. Yes. Legumes, peas, fava beans, and fetch. Um, most peas will need trellising. Um, there are three kinds of peas, um, shelling, snow, and sugar snap. A uh, fall heat wave unfortunately can kill planting. So once again, um, it's just good to know that that can happen in our area and to try to be prepared by watering them ahead of time and providing shade if need be and you know crossing your fingers and hoping that you get through it. Um, a nice uh, note on fava and vetch is that they make uh, great cover crops because they fix nitrogen for us. Root crops, um, 
include things like carrots, beets, rutabagas, turnips. Um, we always want to sow um, seed directly because they are a tap root and they don't like to be transplanted. They come in all kinds of beautiful colors and gophers love them as much as we do. Um, and we'll be talking about how to try to keep them at bay later on in the presentation also. Um, once they come up, you want to thin them um, to one inch and they are fabulous in your soups and salads. Um, a great planting tip is to mix your carrot seed um, with a little bit of sand because that'll help you get an even distribution and also to cover the seeds um, with some newspaper to keep it moist um, while they are trying to germinate. Great. So there are a lot of vegetables you can still plant. Yes. And that is great. All right. Um, we have developed several to our classes on integrated pest management, and you are going to get a little bit of fall gardening IPM in about five minutes. And we are, I have actually one minute to go before the hour is up. So I'll talk really fast. <clears throat> so we'll follow up on the resources provided today. We're just going to talk about a couple of pests that you're probably going to run into this fall or winter. The good news is the flying insects that prefer heat are gone or will be gone soon, and you're left with the creepy crawlies and the burrowing mammals to deal with. And they are sla snails, slugs, earwigs, and gophers. There's a lot more, but you know, that's that's the primary um, multi-celled organisms we have to worry about. So master gardeners recommend integrated pest management as an approach and we strive to prevent, not control, um, pests. So like keep, nip them in the bud before they get started. And then know the pest that you're trying to control if you get to the point of having to control it and find the most effective methods. And that means you need to know about the pest and the host that it's on, and the environment that it's in and use minimally damaging control methods uh, if it does come to that. So control methods fall into four categories, cultural, exclusion, mechanical, and chemical. Let's talk about how that applies to us. To explain what those are, um, cultural, what does that mean? Well, that kind of equates to modifying the environment to reduce the habitat for the pests. So for you, that means you clean up the wood pile that's in the corner or the pile of weeds that's harboring a whole city full of snails and slugs and earwigs, or you clean your pruning shears in between cups when you're pruning fruit trees so you don't transfer um, uh, a disease organism, or you choose the right plant that does well in your area. For example, there may be um, here on the coast, we need roses that resist fungal disease because we have a lot of fog. So that's kind of an example, it's, it's esoteric. What does cultural control mean? Um, it means a couple of things like that. Exclusion is much easier to get your arms around. That is just keeping the pest out or keeping it away from the plant. And prevention is the best solution. This is what we use most of all, I think. And we do it with netting in the summer, row covers, which can double as little frost guards. Um, that's that see-through material that you can, um, it gets light and wa water and air can get in, but the insects and slugs and snails and birds and different things cannot get in. Um, other kinds of barriers, fencing, if you have a deer problem, underwiring is the thing that people tend to use for gophers. We're gonna um, spend a few slides on gophers. So that's a thing. And then what we call mechanical controls. And um, one of those obvious ones for snails is you pick them off with your fingertips. You do it, you do it at about 10 o'clock at night with a flashlight and you go stalking on patrol and uh, <laughs> pick them off. And if you do that mm, three days in a row, you will probably knock out a whole generation of snails. So don't worry, it's not like you have to do it every night for the rest of your life, but uh, you can you can make a dent on the population if you just go out there a couple nights in a row. 
Washing is another thing with if you if you get an aphid infestation, you hit them hard with a spray of water. That's a mechanical control. Um, trapping your um, vertebrate pests, that would be gophers and uh, mice and rats and things like that. And then weeding is another form of um, mechanical control of pests, weed pests that are in your garden. So that's what those types of controls mean. And then I just wanted to take you through a few of the pests that you're going to run into. We talked about slugs and snails, earwigs. They live in the in the borders of a wooden bed, and they come out at night and they chomp up everything. And it's sometimes hard to know whether you've got an earwig or a snail or a slug eating your eating your plant. So that's another good reason to go out at night with a flashlight. And um, what I've given you here in this presentation is a link to the wonderful UC IPM website, which has everything you want to know about identification, their life cycle, what kind of damage they do so you can tell what it is, and then how to manage them, starting with the least offensive one, trapping, sanitation, we talked about cleaning up the wood, uh, chemical controls is your last resort. In this case, they are recommending an organic, a certified organic approved uh, control called spinosad, which is a disease that the earwigs get and nobody else gets. So that's um, a better way to do chemical control. Um, the cabbage worm, that's that beautiful white butterfly that you see flitting around. It happens in the warmer part of, a, of an Indian summer time frame. We're about to lose them, but we could have another heat spell. So uh, they will come and lay eggs on the underside of your cabbage family plants in particular, and um, can just turn them into lace work. So that's a thing to look out for. And then sow bugs, pill bugs, whatever you want to call those guys, they don't really eat plants. They eat decaying vegetation. So they kind of get the, the wrap for other things that, that they chew on plants, and then they're eating the, the edges that are decaying. Here are our burrowing mammal friends, small, medium, and large. We have gophers is going to be the biggest issue anybody um, on this call is probably going to have. Moles, just to say, they don't eat plants. They eat grubs and, and under, underground uh, invertebrate creatures, and they don't eat plants. They may make your lawn look like heck, and uh, they might knock your tulip bulbs out of the way, but um, they have a big territory. They defend that territory. It's one mole per territory space. And the same with gophers. They are territorial and they have a, about a football field territory. So once you get the, get the vertebrate, you're probably good for a little while until somebody else comes and inhabits their, their run. And volts are on the list, but they're just um, very rare as a problem in uh, a garden setting. They tend to um, only be a trouble when there's a whole lot of them. And they are very prolific breeders, but um, it takes a lot of them. So we're not really going to talk about them. So managing gophers. We've all got them, just the way it is. They don't like daffodils. Is there a cultural control? Is there a plant you can plant that isn't a gopher plant? That they don't like. Well, they can't eat daffodils, but they don't mind going under them, around them, or over them to get to the plants they do want. So really, there is no cultural control for, for gophers. There is exclusion, and a lot of people who have the money and the time and the and the, can do the effort will underwire complete beds, will plant in little baskets. There's even an underground fence I've seen that's three feet down that kind of encircles a, a growing area. Um, for that, I'm just going to say the big takeaway is no chicken wire. Chicken wire kind of uh, decomposes after a year. It, it, it rusts and it rots in the ground. So don't use that. Use this stuff, this little quarter inch hardware cloth, and that'll last a lot longer if you're going to under, undergird a bed. The way I always handle it is with traps. You have to patrol your yard every day to make sure you um, set the traps. 
Um, it's, it's not fun. Trapping's not great. We're going to talk about trapping. Um, but it sure does work um, to knock down a population of gophers. And they tend to be active in the fall when the soil gets soft and active in the spring when they have the little babies. Then, of course, if you're really lucky, you have an aggressive cat or dog that eats, um, eats them. Coyotes will eat them, owls and snakes, all those beautiful circle of life kind of things. But they're not going to take out all the gophers that you need them to do. So a couple of gopher trapping tips with not getting into it too deeply. Um, I have this little diagram of what goes on underground. There's a couple of kind of holes that you'll see. There's a straight up hole in the ground that you, you know, you can see into it. They pop up there. Sometimes they eat grass around the edges. There's one that's kind of a sideways. It's got a mound of dirt on one side, but not on the other. That's their lateral run that they're pushing dirt out of. And then they've got a main run. That's where you want to set the traps is uh, the main runs. And they have all kinds of little, little areas underneath their food place and their nest place. It's, it's They're interesting creatures. So finding the tunnel is half the battle. If you can do that, you're in good shape. So here's a little uh, link to a video on how to find the gopher tunnel. Then we have the traps. Wait, you're not supposed to do that. Stop that. What is happening here? Okay, different kind of traps. This is a Maccabee. This is over 150 years old, this design. Um, it is dangerous to use for me because I, because you, you can poke yourself very easily. Uh, it's really gnarly to extract the dead gopher from it because they're impaled. I do not use these, but they're tried and true for some. This is called a cinch trap. A lot of people have good success with that. You kind of put it in the pop hole or the lateral run. And all this uh, metal plate stuff stays on the outside. I have dogs. I can't have the metal plate sticking out. They might get whacked in the nose. Um, I know they like to investigate the gopher holes, so I don't use that one, but lots of people do. Uh, box traps, they work really well, but you have to dig down and put them in the run, and they, it requires a lot of big digging. It's very disturbing, and you can disturb your plants, and it becomes a pain. Oh, not again. I don't know what's happening here. Okay. This is my favorite. It's called a gophinator. And um, it's small. It's a little tricky to set. I've given you a video on how to set it. You can find them online, or I've gotten them in San Lorenzo Lumber, and there's other places I'm sure you can get them. Uh, but this is my preferred uh, application of death to uh, gophers. It's good to record this. If you ever just uh, Google IPM, this site should come up. It's UC ANR's Integrated Pest Management site, and it is a great resource. And just because um, it looks like this when you get there, um, it's a lot of words. So I want to walk you through how to, how, to, how to use it. So if you have a plant, it's being damaged. You don't know what's damaging it. You can look it up by plant and see what kind of pests uh, bother that plant. Or if you think you know what the pest is, you can browse by pest and find out what to do about the pest. Or they have a very clever diagnostic tool, which is um, kind of a little uh, decision tree that can take you to solutions also. So this is one of those wonderful websites that you want to retain. Or you can just mimic nature, right, Bridget? Yeah, so one thing that we also like to point out that um, fall is also a good time to take a break. Um, you know, as opposed to the tagline from the movie Glengarry Glenglock, for, you know what I'm saying, um, play originally actually, um, always be closing. You don't always have to be growing. Um, so there is nothing wrong with taking fall off, um, you know, throwing some, cover crop into your garden beds, 
putting away the garden tools and just taking a break for the season and thinking about getting back um, into the swing again come January, February, when you start want to start planning for spring. If you do want to do some things over the fall, but um, maybe not necessarily grow veg, um, it's also a really good time to do anything that you might need to do structurally. Maybe one of your garden beds needs to be repaired. Maybe um, you've decided to install garden beds. Um, maybe you've put some money aside so that you can put in a drip system. Um, it's a great time to take seed inventory before you buy seeds, remind yourself exactly what you have. And it's also a great time to take really good care of your tools, give them a nice clean and the ones that it's appropriate for, sharpen them up. Um, and it's also a really good time to just um, brew yourself a cup of yummy tea or whatever beverage you like and start perusing really high quality seed magazines, um, catalogs. Um, one of my favorites is Johnny's because there is a lot to be learned from a really good seed catalog. And maybe you'll get some ideas of a crop that you wanna play with come spring that you um, haven't um, tested out yet. And it's a good time to learn about that crop ahead of time and be prepared in the spring to grow it. My darling, we are running so late. Let's take some questions. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing a lot of questions, but I think they're in the chat. I know, but there I'm not seeing them. There really weren't very many questions in the chat that haven't already been answered, at least. Oh, great. Um, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully everyone got their information uh, you know, right as we were going along. Um, the only one that I saw that probably didn't get in there is kind of uh, a little bit of a, a tangent, but still something we might always be interested in, is about planting local milkweed if, um, if you're within five miles of the coast. Do you have any specific information on that? Okay. Bridget, you Anna want me to do this? You can take it, please. So um, it's not recommended by some, but it's certainly available at every garden center. And uh, the garden centers tend to sell uh, tropical um, milkweeds. They're showier and they're prettier uh, and they still attract the, uh, the butterflies. But we want them to overwinter here and then take off. We want them to go. We want them to go wherever they're migrating to um, and do their, their summer thing. And if we keep them here by planting mil milkweed, that can defeat the purpose. So that's my understanding about that, but I would definitely uh, go down to natural bridges and confirm that assumption, but that's what I've heard. All right, uh, so we do have one little question that just came right in uh, about the biggest obstacles to plant, to growing ranunculus. Obstacles to growing ranunculus. Um, I usually, with both ranunculus and anemones, they're two of my very favorite flowers and probably the only bulbs that I buy and plant every year. Uh, they're not bulbs, they're corms, I think. Not sure what they are, but they're these little nuggets and I soak them in water for a few hours and then plant them. And you never know which is the right side up with the anemone, but with the ranuncula, you know that you plant it with the little pokey sides down. Um, and you want to plant it at the correct depth, and that should be available when you plant, you know, as information when you when you buy them. Um, and then you got to protect them from gophers, definitely, because they like to chomp those. Um, and I found that they like to be fed. They like to be fed a couple of times in their lifespan. And if you keep them deadheaded and fed, you will have them all for the longest time. And they're just great cut flowers. Right. That makes me want to go out and plant some right now. Um, <laughs> I, I don't see any other questions at this point. Okay. 50 people and no questions. You can ask anything. My mother's maiden name, anything. <laughs> Give us something to do for 10 minutes. Come on. <laughs> A shy audience. Okay, well, it looks like everybody wants to go eat dinner. 
oh, let's do this. Uh-oh, somebody wants to dig up their calla lilies and transplant them. You know, I don't know how you can even get rid of calla lilies. You can plant them anywhere. You can dig them up anytime and transplant them anytime. I have had trouble eradicating them. <laughs> so shouldn't be a problem. Uh, snail tip. Good. Well, Here they come. Now they're coming. Whoa. All right. All right. <laughs> all right. We have people that think pill bugs eat seedlings. You know, they might go through a little seedling stem and kind of fell it like a tree, like a beaver in a tree. But uh, normally, if there's enough detritus around to eat, they won't bother plants. That's my experience. Um, and I just think that they get a bad rap. You see a little hole in a strawberry and you see a little pill bug inside it eating. Well, it's eating the margins that are rotting, but the slug made the hole. <laughs> so I can't verify for sure that no pill bug in history ever, ever uh, ate a seedling, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not too worried about them. Okay, we have somebody who wants to transplant yarrow. It's probably good to do all the perennial transplanting in the winter. 25 squash seedlings this summer. This is Amy. I think that would be uh, uh, the pill bugs that they have. a bad time there. with way too many pill bugs. I wonder why you have so many. You probably mulch. Sometimes they live in the mulch. Why do zucchini have distorted fruit, narrow on one end and fatter on the other? That I believe is usually a poor pollination issue. Do you know, Bridget? Um, I think that's, that is a good answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, sometimes they get a pointy end and, and that can happen. Um, what are cut flowers that can be started now? So if you look at the lists um, that we we went through, a lot of those are cut flowers that can be started now. Let's go back there. Going back, 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 back. Denise, should keep in track of all this? Sure. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Consolidate. Oh, why is this taking so long? I might have to escape. All right, here we're getting to the flowers. Okay, cut flowers. I am a I am a former florist, so I can answer this. Um, chrysanthemums, black eyed Susan, celosia, echinacea, rutabecchia, stock, foxglove, snapdragon, and larkspur, and sometimes calendula. Those are all cut flowers you can transplant now. And you can plant for next year, sweet peas, poppies, not the best cut flower, but sometimes nigella, which is called love in a mist. Uh, sarinth, this um, purple one on the far right is sarinth. It's a, a beautiful filler cut flower. And so is Chinese forget-me-not. So you can have those. All the bulbs are cut flowers. And some of these natives you can use as cut flowers and penstemons and salvias. Um, those will last a little while in a vase. Any flower can be a cut flower for a little while. <laughs> okay, feed, feed us another one. Um, is there right. a place to find straw to be used as mulch? I'm from the Midwest and don't see it here often. Um, I buy my straw from feed and farm supplies locally. Um, so do I, and it's really hard to find straw free. I would love to, but um, sometimes on Craigslist you can find it. It's rare. So, and it, and the price has just gone up. It used to be $9 and now it's something like 15, 17 mm -hmm. for bail. It's crazy, the supply chain deal. Yeah, so I'm afraid that's, that's how you gotta go. It's an investment. 
Hey, I'm going to take a quick dive into, I will, I'm happy to answer questions as long as anybody wants to stay, but um, we have got this Master Gardener plant sale going on. Uh, we have an, an evaluation survey. It's going to come to you by email along with this presentation again. And we really encourage you to use it and answer questions about how this presentation was for you. And in fact, I think Denise is going to copy and paste that into the chat right now if you want to just get that over with. I told you about the garlic class. Uh, I told you about the plant sale. I told you about, oh, I didn't tell you about, we're having a microgreens year round. It's a grow your own microgreens class. It's um, a whole bunch of sprouts and you'll go home with trays of sprouts to grow. That's kind of fun. Um, tool care, we have a class coming up in November and then wildflowers, not weeds. That's the one where we're going to we're going to plant wildflowers in a lasagna garden and learn all about wildflowers, native ones. All right, back to questions. All righty. Um, let's see. Um, Ellen would like to know how to bag fruit to protect it. Uh, maybe grapes in particular, but uh, keeping them away from pests. Jet, you want this one? Um, I have um, some experience with uh, bagging fruit and um, that was more in an agricultural sense um, where um, we were um, using a special netting where we basically are netting the entire tree um, to protect it. Um, and there's some things that you can buy that you can wrap individual fruits um, that won't affect their growth. Um, I um, am not um, knowledgeable. I don't have experience on what you would do in particular for grapes. All right. Yeah, I've seen other other fruit just brown paper bag and a and a string, mm -hmm. but it's a lot of effort. You got to really want the fruit. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Um, what about uh, taking care of dahlias in the winter? Dig them up or leave them? That is a question that I will um, say is one of those, it depends. Um, I know a lot of dahlia growers that believe in um, digging up their bulbs uh, every year and um, storing them in straw and um, replanting them next season. Um, I'll just say with a caveat that most of those folks are growing them to sell them and um, they've got a lot of help with that. Um, I grow dahlias and before I planted them, I did do um, the landscape wire that we talked about earlier. And I just kind of risk it and hope that the gophers don't come for them. And for the most part, um, I get lucky with that. But it, it really depends. All right. In, in our uh, counties, I think we're usually okay without digging them up if you can, if you've got the space for them. Yes, we are. All right. Um, I thought this one got answered, but let's go ahead and I think it maybe it got missed. Um, the and Santa I, Cruz. Just one more, one more, sorry. Oh. No um, thing on dahlias is also um, another good reason for digging. My fly friend is back, um, really wants to be the star of the show, um, is um, that once you, um, you can separate um, uh, the tubers too, you know, and, and get more dahlias if you, if you dig them up. So that's also a reason that you might want to do that. All right. On the, on the dahlias, are they suitable for containers? Yes, I've grown both. I've grown them in the soil and they do really well in containers. Mm -hmm. yep. And you don't All have right. to worry so much about, you know, um, gophers coming and taking them to their lovely little homes. All right, uh, let's see. Oh, does the Santa Cruz WaterWise wet water, wow. The WaterWise website indicate California native plants? It has a mix, so California natives and non-natives, but they're all drought tolerant. But it doesn't necessarily separate them out. I think that was the question. It, it will say so in the, in the detail, and I think there's a there's an advanced search you can use. 
All right. Uh, let's see. I'm sorry, I've jumped around a little bit. So, <laughs> and also put questions in here more than once. Um, how to keep uh, Matalhia poppies from spreading all over? Yeah, good luck. <laughs> They're a very successful California native. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very hard to keep but them under sometimes control. Sometimes they're hard to get going. And, you know, that's a good problem to have. <laughs> I would sell plants to nurseries, maybe. Does anybody, right. uh, Master Gardeners on the call, does anybody want to unmute and talk about their Mahalea poppies? Because I've never, I, I don't grow them myself. Don't have the space. No takers. Nope. I, I don't know how to do that except mechanically dig them up and maybe mulch heavily around the plant. Maybe even with cardboard underneath. Try that. <laughs> All right. Uh, the only other question we had was about getting the, the slides from the event. Um, and I'm not entirely sure, um, Michael, you said you didn't get an email link and that confuses me. I'm not sure if that means, so you must have so had I, one to get when I sent a I sent a reminder an hour before class or 45 minutes before class. And I included a link to the presentation that you guys saw today. We are gonna make a few tweaks and add a few speaker notes and send it out again. And we're gonna send an email to everybody who was on the call or who registered anyway, you have to be in our registration system to get it. Um, so we will be sending it out again, along with that um, evaluation link. All right, and the recording. And the recording, embarrassing right. but true. <laughs> <laughs> all right, okay, well, hopefully that answers all that. That's all the questions that I have come across. If there's anything else, you better right click. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank you for the nice words. Very sweet comments. And one more thing. Don't go. We've got a hotline. So here's a link to the Master Gardener hotline. If anything's keeping you up at night that you need to talk about related to your garden, you can send the question there along with pictures if you like. And uh, one of our talented Master Gardeners will get back to you. Super terrific. Thank you, Amy. You're our best uh, salesperson. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. We will Thanks see you at the next class for the plant sale. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Bridget and Denise. Thank you, Delete. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Nighty night. <laughs>